What's going on, everybody? This is Ryan Ank with Cashflow Dad Life uh, coming at you with another episode. We've got an amazing guest on, uh, probably one of the most impressive people uh, that I can think of. Uh, he, he has gone from teacher, uh, like me, uh, start off. Actually, we got similar stories, except I didn't have the level of success that you have. But he went from teacher, cranked out a bunch of kids, was like, crap, I need to find a way to provide for my family. Uh, got some uh, credit lines and bought two fourplexes and now owns a company, uh, Avesta, that owns $1.13 billion in assets, and, uh, which, which is in a, a pretty amazing feat. So, guys, we're on the line here with an absolute uh, Trojan. I don't know if that's the right word. I, just Trojan just came to mind. I don't even know why. <laughs> it's like a, like a tycoon real estate tycoon, Rob Reynolds, uh, uh, want to see if you're there and on the line and if, if, if you can hear me all right. Hey, thanks a lot, Ryan. Thanks for having me. And yeah, man, all's, all's uh, clear. I was also thrown off by that Trojan comment. <laughs> <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't sure what to say after that. I was like, Trojan, or I don't know. I don't know. I threw myself off. Sorry about that. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> well, can you, uh, can you kind of walk us through? You're, you actually have a really incredible story. And as a husband, how many kids do you have now? I have six daughters. Six, six, six daughters, daughters, man. Completely yeah. opposite of me. You don't, I don't know how to make girls, and, and you don't know how to make a penis. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> yeah, I guess I don't have any Y chromosomes. I'm not sure, man. But yeah. I kind of yeah. hold to the fact that my, I think my wife must be killing all the Y chromosomes in, in utero. So. Well, don't, don't let her around my wife because she might ser- share some secrets Right. I, don't, I don't have uh, weddings to pay for right now. You right. Get six of them. Unless yeah. they all go to the convent, which is, you know. Hopefully that tradition changes with that whole uh, bride's family paying for the wedding. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good luck between now and the time they get married. Yeah. So can you, uh, can you kind of walk <clears throat> us through, like, um, so you're a teacher. You've got, you've got a couple kids, and uh, probably like most teachers, you're thinking, man, this isn't, this just isn't going to make things, it's just not going to make ends meet. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, my, my wife, Maria, she, she was kind of of the mentality, Hey, listen, when we start having kids, I'd really like to stay at home. And, you know, I, I thought to myself, man, that's, that's cool. My, my parents didn't do that. They were, they were actually both teachers themselves. Um, But I thought, you know, there's no better person to raise my kids than her. So I was like, all right, I'll, I'll figure it out. So I was, I was teaching in, in the Northeast, actually in, in New York. And um, yeah, I, early on, I realized, okay, I'm going to have to have some other type of supplemental income. And my brother, Peter, graduated after me from college and really was passionate about getting into real estate. And he's like, yo, Rob, let's, let's do this. So I'm like, uh, sure, real estate sounds good, you know? <laughs> Sounded to me like a passive income play, I think. And, uh, you know, I'm like, cool. So you just get some property you and you just collect rent, you know, and it's that easy. Right. But obviously, it has very, it has almost, it's definitely not like that. Um, right. Lot, well, lot, especially, lot especially not the way you did it. <laughs> yeah. And you know what, man, you, a lot of people come out of college and they, they think they're something with their degree, which is nothing. And, yeah. uh, and then they think they're not going to have to work for, you know, to really come up, you know, mm-hmm. and I see this all the time too, in owning a company and, and, and people, you know, the young people coming out of college, they, they want to be CEO in five years. I'm like, dude, it's not, <laughs> it doesn't not work like that. So, right. so I get out, I'm, I'm teaching, looking for, for other income, my brother, graduates college. He's like, let's do real estate. Cool, man. I have no idea what that's about. My parents being teachers are like, are you crazy? Don't do this. <laughs> and, uh, 2005, we get a couple four unit, um, rental properties in the Northeast. And, you know, within a year we, you know, it was, it was 2005. So anyone who, who was an adult for that time period, you realize that's before the recession of right. you know, 2008, I would say t- mid 2007 is really when it happened to us. But so everything was going great and you could, you know, you didn't have, you know, there was people that couldn't pay their cell phone bills that were buying homes. 
Right. So, you know, something had to give, right? But we didn't mm-hmm. we didn't see it. But we we got two four unit places, rented them out. We we even got money at closing, like it was one hundred and three percent financed. So, <laughs> right. you know, we were in leverage heaven or or hell looking back at it. But right. uh, we put in this the money that we got back at closing. We put it into the into the property, and within a year, they're they're both worth a lot more. Um, when yeah. they were reappraised for a lot more money. So we took out lines of credit on both. And then we got a lot more stuff in, in, in the Northeast. And by 2007, we had about, let's say, between me, my brother, and one other friend of ours, uh, Dan French, we had probably like 90 apartments and probably wow. maybe 25 buildings. And uh, yeah, so... That was by 2007, and yeah, we, you know, we thought we were, we thought we were ballers, man, hip hoppers, <laughs> and uh, all was good. We just thought anything we touched was gold, and um, and then the market turned, man, and we realized what we were touching was dust, and yeah, we we had to fight through it. It was I, I remember Ryan. It was like June 2007. It was a month after my first daughter was born. We were married for a year. And it stuff hit the fan. We went through three different property managers for most of our apartments and they were just screwing, like screwing us left and right. Yeah. And, you know, charging 60 bucks to change a light bulb type thing on their invoices. And like, what the heck? People stopped paying rent. They couldn't find new renters. You know, it was just, it was chaotic. And we just, I remember looking at each other and we were like, yo, we, we, we're either going to go bankrupt or we got to move up, you know, to the capital region in New York and uh, try to figure out how to manage real estate. And that's what we did. So, so before then you weren't working full time, uh, managing apartments. Were you still, were you still a teacher? I was still a teacher. And I was, I've, I was a teacher until 2011. So I was a full time teacher until 2011 public school, high school. And I was doing, full-time real estate managing my own properties and learning how to do that. I mean, again, you know, drinking out of a fire hose type thing. Right. It's stuff when you look back on it, man, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, as in, in starting your own companies and all it's you look back and like, what the heck, man, how did I get through that? You know? And right. Yeah. You know, and, and have little babies at home that are, you know, crying through the night and I'm, I'm going up to the capital region, which is two and a half hours from where I lived. I basically uh-huh. lived there the entire summer in 2007. And we were just, my brother and I were hustling. And at the end of the end, end of the summer, he was going to law school. So, and I was going back teaching. So we had a tight deadline. We got to figure this out in two and a half months or else it's bankruptcy. So we had, we had to do that. You know, it's interesting uh, how, how you mentioned that and you, you started off with talking about how your degree <laughs> is pretty much worthless when it, when it comes down to it. Um, because you know, it's one of those things that Robert Kiyosaki talks about is that we we're kind of told in our life to avoid failure. And, uh, and that's what school teaches us is to avoid failure. Like failing on a test is bad, but in reality, it's those pressure moments, um, and those failures and those mistakes that kind of push us in a certain direction. And it definitely pushed you guys into launching something pretty substantial with a, with a pretty high purpose. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what I discovered over that, that period of time, you know, every, every book we were reading on property management and real estate was, it was the mantra was treat people as income. This is business. And, you know, just put up a wall between you and the tenants and you're just there to collect money. Mm -hmm. And that's just not the way I was raised, man. You know, you know, I'm a person deep, deep with faith and, you know, love of God. And I was like, you know, I see, I see other human beings as equal in, in the eyes of God. And, and I just wasn't, I wasn't down with that mentality and that, but I'd already gotten into it. So I'm like, man, I'm not treating people like that. Like if I'm going to Ryan's house and collecting rent, I want to, I want to know how he's doing, how his family, how his wife and kids are doing, how, you know, how his business is going. And then I want to see if there's anything I can do to improve his home. Um, 
And that's what I did. And I thought for years, man, I thought I was doing that at the, at the cost of profit. You know, I thought, oh, I guess I'm just not a good businessman and I'm, I must be leaving profit on the table, but you know, my, my vertical relationships more important and I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it this way. Cause I want to, I want to glorify people and acknowledge their dignity. And um, dude, it, it was, it turned out the opposite. I mean, what happened was Ryan um, in turn took better care of, of his home, not of, not of his, you know, um, he wasn't just a tenant. He was a resident, you know, and it wasn't a unit that he lived in. He lived in a home, you know, and us right. talking like that, man, language is so important and people forget that, you know, and yeah, we, we used that language because we believed it and it helped them believe it too. And it, it really just gave them a sense of ownership and more pride in, in where they lived. And we were, we were in all tough areas, lower income areas, tough neighborhoods. And, um, we, uh, over time, people's behavior started changing. So they went, you know, they would start paying rent on time or early. So we wouldn't have to chase them down all the time. Um, and time is money. So not having to chase is you're saving money. Then they would clean up common areas, you know, instead of me doing it or me having to pay people to do it, they would just do it themselves. Cause again, this pride of ownership, man, they're taking ownership and it was just from me respecting them and acknowledging them as human beings, you know? Um, and then they, they would tell us if there was other like shady neighbors, drug dealers or whatever, and they, and we would evict them and then they would refer other good people in. So they were doing our marketing. Right. You know, also all this stuff was cutting down our expenses and it was costing us nothing. Yeah. And I'm like, dang, man. It's, I mean, I'm a slow learner, man. It took me like three or four <laughs> years. I'm like, wait, I'm like, this is actually the better way to do business. I'm like, what's, what are all these books talking about? So that's kind of how we founded Avesta, man, on, on that, those principles. You know, um, in 2010 was when we, after my brother graduated law school, I was still living in Connecticut. We got together with another guy from his law school, Nate Fisher, and we, we said, let's, let's make this big. My, my brother Pete was like, let's, let's blow this out. You know, we had learned our lessons from those years. And, uh, you know, we kind of broke down that approach that I just shared with you. And my brother so, was like, yeah, that's how we got to do it. So that's how so, we started it. So yeah. you didn't just set up, I mean, you started off like, Hey, I'm going to make some passive income with a couple fourplexes. And uh, yeah. what that turned into is not just a real estate company or, or a real estate investment. What it turned into was a, uh, a very principle centered business. Can you walk sure. us through like the stages uh, like what was going on in your head when you were sitting down, you sat down and, and mapped out all your values and, and you're like, you know, we want this to be people centered and we want to improve communities. <clears throat> what were some of those pillars, uh, those foundations of setting up this company? Yeah. So for one, you know, in the, in a bigger scheme, I would say I, I've never been much of a, I'm a very long-term think thinker in terms of lifetime length, you know, and where I want to be at the end of my life. And, you know, I think you have to be, if you're going to have a lot of kids or be willing to have a lot of kids is you got right. to to delay some gratification and, and invest in your retirement through, through having company that, that loves you rather than, uh, you know, just vacations or something. So right. long-term thinker in that way, but I'm not like a five-year goal type of guy. You know? And if I had been, I could tell you right now, there was never a time five years ago that I would know at all that I would be where I'm at right now, five years later. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. Yeah. So when I got into real estate, I was not thinking, oh yeah, in you know, 13 years, you're going to have 400 employees and you just don't, like that right. was on my radar. That wasn't wasn't a bucket list and it was nothing. It was like, no, I, I got into real estate for practical reasons, but then it, there, there came a pur purpose behind it, you know, and a, a mission. So it was founded on to answer your question that, that idea that man, you can really, by acknowledging people's dignity and like really respecting them, you can actually start building community, you know, interactive community for, for people. And, just through acknowledging them and their families 
and all that. And then you're creating these positive environments for people to live just by taking the little extra time and screening the people that are moving in there, you know? Um, so you were actually, part of your strategy was actually going into some of these areas that might have been, you know, a little worn down, uh, people not paying their rent, maybe even drug dealers around, and, and you'd improve these communities and, definitely. and start treating people like people instead of a rent number, and, and you'd, you'd see major differences? Major differences that I went through before. I mean, if you start tr treating people like people, they'll start acting like people, you know? Yeah. Um, and again, man, you're, you're a teacher. I think most people who, who would be listening to this can relate if, if their parents are at, or if they've had to influence anyone. I mean, if you treat people the way that you want them to act, they'll start acting that way, you know? Yeah. Um, if you disrespect them all the time, they're going to start acting disrespectfully back, you know? And, but the same is true if you hold them to a high standard. Um, so yeah, that's what we do. And, and, and there was high standards too, man. Like, at first, there, there were times where I would allow people to pay their rent later than normal late fee, you know, because of the bleeding heart stories and the bills and all this other stuff that they had to pay or their husband's sick and yada, yada. And I would walk out of there and pat myself on the back and be like, yeah, you just did a good deed. And then <laughs> five days later, they'd be like, hey, can I get another five days? I'm like, oh, it's uh, okay, you know, okay, another pat on the back. Then it's like going in the next month. And I, I remember thinking one day, I'm like, they may as well have just come right into my apartment and stolen $700 off my table. I'm like, this is, this is stealing like anything else. I'm like, yo, if, if I have a cart full of groceries and I'm walking out of a grocery store and the person at the register, the cashier is like, hey, uh, where are you going with that? I'm like, oh, thanks, Ryan, I'll pay you later. I w walk out of the store. Like, what does everybody say that is? Yeah, it's a thief, right? Yeah. yeah, it's stealing, right? But when it comes to not paying for your shelter, it's like, <laughs> right. man, you're a slumlord. Like, what are you doing? So I realized <laughs> early on. So I would be very, I'd be very nice, and I learned from teaching. Like, you don't have to yell to have to have authority, man. You just have to be consistent. So that's that's what we did, and you know, people would get evicted, and once once one person would get evicted, the whole everybody knew, like, oh crap, this guy ain't playing. And he's also respectful. So, you know, when they tried to manipulate me for being nice and realized that didn't work, it's still, I was still being loving the whole time. I'm like, yeah, if you're not paying, it's not fair to anyone else, including me. So you're out. Well, you know, so that was it. Yeah. But, you know, building that community, Ryan, that was, that was a big thing. And just giving people a home where they could live abundantly. That's, that was, that's our mission. Give people a home where they can live abundantly. Yeah. So when you, when you would acquire these properties, would you immediately evict people? Um, or uh, like there was a rest, uh, a restoration aspect to them, a renovation aspect to them sure. as well, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it would, I wouldn't say it was immediate, but it would be more, you know, we would, we would evaluate where people are at. So we would, we'd go and with teams, we'd just introduce, you know, at first it would just be us. We'd introduce ourselves and tell them what's up and, you know, see how everything is and what needs, what needs to be improved and all this stuff. Where, where are your frustrations? You know, get a pulse. That, that was our first thing. Get a pulse and, and assess things. How's the neighborhood? How are your neighbors? So if like five different people are like, Oh, Ryan, he's a scumbag. Um, please get him out of here. This guy is trouble. And then I go to Ryan. He's like super nice. And it's like, yeah, man, uh, I love this place. Everybody loves me. I'm like, yeah, I haven't paid your rent. Um, he's like, yeah, I know. I, I already drew up a deal with the previous owner. I was paying the 20. I'll be like, okay, Ryan's about to be out of here. You know? Right. So we, we get a pulse and then, yeah, some people, if they, if they couldn't, if they couldn't pay the rent or whatever, then, then they'd have to leave. We typically would work with them like, Hey, how much time do you need? And you're not going to get like a ton of time we'll give you some time to help them in their transition cool or connect them to agencies. We, we try that, but a lot of times we, we put that on, we put that on them and, and do our best to help out. You know, we try to give people ownership, man. And in order to take ownership, you gotta, you gotta give it, yeah. you gotta give responsibility. So, right. so yeah, that's what we did. Oh, that's and, awesome. And have been doing. So when, um, 
you don't get to 12,000 apartments and 1.13 billion in assets on your own. So tell me a little bit about how you structured the team and the responsibilities that each team member had when you were in this growth phase. Yeah. Well, uh, when, when you reached out, out to me to, to kind of connect and, and speak with you about this, my, my first reservation was like, man, this isn't about me, you know, cause this didn't happen just because of me. We have, we have 400 teammates here, to, you know, great people. And the key man is it, it's hiring. It really is. And we, we took, we took a lot of investment into hiring the right people. We learned that lesson early on from the, those early days of um, that, that great recession that I referred to, that was, that was a rough patch because you didn't know when the recession is going to end. You know, we look right. back now, we're like, Oh, well, you know, it only lasted to 2010. I'm like, you don't know in 2009, that's going to end in a year. Like, right. You know, it's just there. And you're like, Holy cow, how am I going to get through this? So we would hire really ch cheap people to do our, our maintenance and to do, you know, our, our oversight or general contracting, all this stuff or, you know, construction, whatever. And man, we got burned so many times, man. And there's just no, there's no good reason to compromise virtue over talent. So, so you, you wouldn't hire cheap people if you had to do it again. You'd, fi you'd, you'd find the best talent and pay them whatever it cost. Yeah. I mean, within, within reason we're, yeah, we're going to, I mean, not whatever it costs. Right. We're going to pay, we're going to pay. <laughs> right. Yeah. We're going to pay a premium for the right people. And we're also going to take three weeks to get the right person. Even if we need them four days from now, you know, we're going to take an additional two and a half weeks to get the right person because I've just, I've been through it enough to realize, no, man, there's no urgency when it comes to getting the right person. Like it's, it's always more important than it is urgent. So an ur urgency would be like calling the fire department when there's a fire, but right. when you don't have the right person, you do not hire out of urgency and you have to have the discipline to know that and to actually execute on that. So we, we learned it from the hard way, man, because those, those cheaper people would steal from us when we turned our head. So they were great and they could do the work. They knew how to do things. Mm -hmm. um, they had the talent, but they didn't have the virtue. And when we would turn our backs or, you know, drive home or whatever, they would, they would start stealing stuff. And that, you know, when you, when it costs you hundreds and then thousands of dollars, you start to learn a lesson that, you know, maybe I read that in a book. I don't remember, but I do remember actually losing thousands of dollars. <laughs> and I won't make that mistake. One one of the things uh, I remember you telling me in the past is that you uh, in in your training is one of the things that your employees would come up to you and they'd say, oh well he's he's good for he's good for the rent he's you know he's just gonna oh, yeah. pay a couple. <laughs> can you can yeah. you tell us tell yeah, us uh, sure. how you would handle that? <laughs> so yeah, it, I um so when I would give training for our company, so I, I basically re led the recruiting, the hiring, and then you know, getting the right people on the bus, right. And then training them and developing them and creating a culture around it. Um, and had great people like Shevin McCullough that would just run, run the hiring and just incredible guy. But I would, I would tell the, especially the people that were inexperienced and new and young, young people that were on the leasing consultant side or, you know, leasing agents or even assistant managers that would have to collect rent and they would have always have these stories and they call up and they, Hey, hey, Rob. Uh, look, I want to give you know Ryan. Um, he needs the ten day extension to pay the rent, you know, and the late fee is assessed. It's fifty dollar late fee. It's assessed two days from now. Can we just can we just waive that late fee and and give them an extra ten days? And I'm like, okay. I'm like, listen, you know, Mike, do you really do you really trust Ryan is going to do that? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely, Rob. Definitely, like I know this guy; he's a good dude. I'm like, you sure about that? Um, yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. I'm like, okay, cool. So look, let's do this. I'm like, I know how much you get paid and all this stuff. I'm like, just spot him, spot him the eight hundred dollars, um, <laughs> and he'll he'll pay you back 
10 days from now, Ryan will pay you back. Plus, so that you saved him the late fee money. And on top of that, man, now he knows you personally have his back and you put your money where your mouth is, you know? <laughs> and, and I would just hear silence <laughs> on the other line at first. And then I'd be like, yeah, you're there. Can we do, you know, like, how about you want to do that? I'm like, that sounds cool, man. It's very admirable. And they're like, no, nah, you know what? Just a victim. Like, 100% <laughs> of the time, man. I'm like, oh, I get it. What is, what is your yeah. money? So, not, so generous you know, with the company's yes, money. <laughs> you're so, you're so generous with the company's money as if it grows on trees, right? Like, how do you think you right. get paid? Right, right. <laughs> you get exactly. paid from him paying his rent. So, um, yeah. So that was, and that was something I learned firsthand, man. Yeah. So, so how did you structure the company? I mean, you had a finance team, you had a marketing team, you have mm -hmm. landlords essentially. Yep. So Cause you guys, you guys aren't just in one place, right? You're all, all across the nation yeah. now. Well, so we're, yeah, we're in, we're throughout Florida. So every major market in Florida and then we're in uh, Texas, we're in uh, big in Austin, San Antonio, Houston, and, and Dallas. Uh, we're, we're actually building our headquarters there now, even though we're in Tampa currently. And, um, we're in Colorado, uh, Westminster, Colorado, outside of Denver and uh, Phoenix, Arizona. So, and yeah, we're, we're expanding. We're looking at various deals in different parts of the country. Um, we, it's fully integrated, right? So we have, we have a whole finance team that does the underwriting, does the modeling, um, really tries to assess, you know, for all those familiar with real estate, it's, you know, it's a, uh, the investment so the you have the valuation you have the in the income which is the noi the net operating income and then you have the cap rates so cap rates is determined by the market you're going to get that from any you know you you call a qualified broker and they can give you the cap rates of your specific market so you got that cap rate um and to get the valuation you got to do the income the noi divided by the cap rate the NOI is the trick. You got to figure out what the NOI is. And to do that, you have to do a very good underwriting process. You got to figure out, okay, how much, how much rent are, are they getting right now? How much rent should they be getting compared to the you know, competitors in the, in the neighborhood? How much are other people getting? What can you do? What types of improvements would the marketplace like? How much do those improvements cost? And what rent up are you going to get? From there, you can figure out, okay, this is our estimated NOI. And now you can come up with a valuation, a strike price that's going to promise us and our investors that this is going to be a good investment and you're going to get a really good IRR, a great internal rate of return on your investment or cash on cash, like however you want to measure it. It's going to be good if you, if you figure out the NOI, right? Because the NOI is going to inform your, what you're going to make an offer, what price you're going to make an offer at. So that, then we have the whole marketing team that does our, you know, our, so our website does our branding our our you know swag all that stuff the the invest the name and image um we have recruiting and hiring so our our hr we call people development um they have you know they're responsible for, for hiring for recruiting for training for developing and then of course the benefits and all that stuff um that we want to make competitive so it's appealing to be at you know um asset management team to, to really assess how, how the assets are doing, um, how they're performing numerically and can work with the community management team, which would be the, you know, the property managers or what, what we would call the community managers. Um, we call properties communities, but whatever, they're interchangeable. Um, you got the property managers, the leasing consultants, the maintenance techs, the service foremans, all of that foreman. Um, that's the internal team. Now we don't, we don't have a construction. We have a construction team as well, but we, we do that on the, like the GC side or we'll hire GC. So major cap cap X plans, capital improvements. We hire people to do that. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then we just oversee them. Um, and you know, we have the procurement side, right. That has national relationships with, uh, you know, suppliers. And um trying to think we missed, you know, and then of course the, the corporate, like, oh, the accounting side as well. Um, we have fairly large accounting team. We do all of our accounting. So everything's, everything's internal, man. I yeah. think the one main thing we do, we don't do ground up construction. So we buy pre-existing um, 
you know, and um, value add uh, typically late eighties, nineties, you know, class B, B minus some B plus now C plus, you know, mm-hmm. and the way the markets turn and the cap rates have turned and, you know, the market's pretty frothy, man. It's, it's definitely a, a seller's market. Um, so the deals we're looking at more now are, are newer deals, you know, that are kind of B plus. Yeah. Um, because you just can't get the value out of C plus the, the, um, the prices are not differentiated enough, you know, They're, yeah. class, class C properties are just selling for too much money right now. Yeah. You know, but when the market turns that will change. So, so do you have a specific strategy as far as what rent rate you want to stay? Do you like, are you trying to stay in between like 600 and a thousand on your, um, uh, no, I mean, it, it's changed. So I think now our, our rent is closer to a thousand, 1200, 1500. Okay. Uh, but yeah, for the first few years. So we got our first, properties in florida in 2011 march 2011 we we bought our first 79 units it was across seven seven buildings or six buildings in florida and that's when avesta started um and yeah so then the rents you know from there until 2012 rents were like you know 550 to maybe 750 mm-hmm. depending on the number of bedrooms you know and we're talking you know from studio to three bedrooms um, but now, now they're, yeah, it's more expensive because the, the class of properties has gone up and it, that's not, that hasn't been like our strategy. You know, we're, we're value add long-term hold. So right. we're not like we wanted to get in on where we could, which was high risk, you know, bad areas. And our goal is to get class A luxury. And like, no, that's not our goal. We just, we're trying to be flexible with the marketplace and where can we create most value right now? Right. Um, in a long-term you know, mentality. Uh, as far as where you're finding the properties, are you looking at mostly on, on the market deals or are you looking at off market deals or is it just I mean, kind of it's, a mix? It's, you know, anyone in, the, in this business would say you, you want off market deals, of course. Right. Because yeah. it's going to be, you're going to get less, less bids that raise, rise the prices and all that stuff. Um, and there's so many people that are taking a piece that you're going to end up paying more, but it's hard to find off market deals. So we, we have a whole part of our investment investor and finance side. We have people that are constantly bird dogging and trying to find off market deals and relationships, you know? Mm-hmm. So we do get off market deals, but it's, it's not, it's not the majority. Um, right. We would love it. We would love it to be only that, you know, but right. they're harder to find. You know? Yeah. So. so one of the things I find interesting is, you know, part of your story is um, you, you, you built this company. Um, uh, obviously, you're a part of building the company that you had a you have a big team that you helped set up around you as well. Um, you built it to one point one three billion in assets and uh, and you're able to quit your job teaching. And now uh, just recently, you you're a very purpose driven person, which mm-hmm. is which is awesome. And that's that's been the cause of a lot of your success, like, you know, the, the virtue behind not treating people like a number or a rent payment, but treating them like people and how that ultimately affected your business and grew your business. But now you're at the point where you basically like, I'm going to fire myself. <laughs> and the good thing is you've got the, you've got the income that's coming in that's allowing you uh, to do that. Can you tell us a, a little bit about where you are now and how important um, having that purpose is no matter how successful you get? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I've recently decided on uh, kind of transitioning out from day to day, you know, working through with my brother and our other partners to now, you know, being on a advisory kind of board level only involvement. And uh, that's, that transition has been over like a six month period. And, you know, I made it official a couple of weeks ago. So I'm, I'm no longer actively involved at, at Avesta, I think looking back, I, I was not planning on this. And again, if I had a five year plan four years ago, it would definitely be like, you know, if I had a 20 year plan, it'd be, I'm going to be at Avesta. But um, yeah, I just feel as I've been feeling a desire to, to do something 
propel something more um, intentionally related to to working closer with people and um, it's crazy i mean we we've hired so many great people that have that have helped build the company that I feel fine walking away from it on on a operational level to allow people other people to run it you know and I think we've empowered the right people to do so. And I didn't hire them so that I could eventually step away from it. I hired them so we could have the greatest company possible. And, but they actually have allowed me to step away from it when I felt called to do so. That's awesome. And, so, yeah. so, so what are you going to focus on? You said people center, but you're going to, I know that you're a, a man of faith. Uh, is mm -hmm. there something that you're going to do more with that? You know, I've, I haven't, determine entirely you know there's um i have an idea of you know there's mr rogers has has come <laughs> up a lot in my mind funny enough but i think he's i think he's impacted a lot of my generation and and older generation well he's just during, like you he's about building communities and neighborhoods uh, right <laughs> yeah right right, right. <laughs> during, during that you know during our youth but just that positive impact and there was just a, a, a movie on him recently, actually it's in the theaters, I think, but he had, he had a way of communicating to kids um, that was very positive and, and really focused on, you know, values and ethics and morals. And um, I think there's still a void there. And um, with, with, you know, him not being on the scene anymore. And I think, largely it's it's been filled with you know the spongebobs and right. the, um, i want to say i don't want to say mind um numbing shows but you know shows that i'm not crazy about my kids watching i'm like man i it would be great to have a show that really focused that drew people in drew young people in um to a relationship with with god or just you know their faith and morals um that that revolved you know through laughter through humor and uh i definitely i know a couple of people that that would that just seem naturally cut out to do something like that and get get out in front of a camera and do it so so you're not getting to get in front of the camera i don't no i don't think so maybe <laughs> from time to time man but more, more so i want to use my talents on i was that. about to say man you're not you're not you're not cut out for that you're not magoo enough I'm no, sorry. Man, no, no, <laughs> no, it's not me. And I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm very, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty self-aware to know that, but I do, have, I do have places. I do have people that, uh, I know a couple people, one in particular that would be incredible for that. So you want to get involved in like some sort of project like that make a, yeah. make a, make a bigger difference. Yeah. Or, you know, just make, make a more fulfilling difference for me in, in the yeah. trend, in the point I'm at right now, you know, and, I look back on it, you know, part of me was like, dang, man, did I waste seven years or 13 years doing this? Like, no, like that was my purpose for the amount of time I was there. And now I'm doing something else. When I was teaching, I didn't, Ryan, I didn't leave teaching. I didn't get into real estate and it got big enough that I could finally leave teaching. I left teaching because I felt, man, I could, I could really have a huge impact or help have, a, you know, impacting things in a big level through this real estate thing. Yeah. I didn't know we would be 12,000 apartment homes right now. Um, at the time, I think we were a couple hundred or not even, it was like 150, but I just, I saw potential man. And, and it, it happened and I was like, Whoa, but that's why I, I, did, I loved teaching. And, you know, I'd still say right now, I, I see myself more as a teacher than a businessman. And, um, but this next thing, it was kind of like, all right, I, this idea excites me a lot. I think there's a lot of potential there and I think there's a great need for it. And, um, someone's got to do it. So That's awesome, man. So, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see what's up. I'm looking forward to it, man. I, I'd like to see you pop in as a guest wearing a little sweater vest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> right, right, right. It's yeah, beautiful so, day in the neighborhood. That's right, man. But yeah, I was, uh, helping create more community for a while and now, uh, yeah, just, desiring to do something else man and you know it's it's the last thing i'll say about it is this it's it's luring it's it's tempting to just stay in a place where you're comfortable you know um 
but one of my favorite quotes is uh, the world promises you comfort, but you're not made for comfort. You're made for greatness. And, That's you know, awesome. um, you know, I could be comfortable for the rest of my life at Avesta and doing whatever active or, or not active, but, you know, involved there on payroll and stuff or whatever. And I was like, man, I'm not, I'm not a mercenary. You know, I want to be a missionary and life is short. And if you're not, if you're not working towards doing something fulfilling, if you're not doing something fulfilling, then, you know, you got to reevaluate things. And I'm not going to say, I'm, I'm not one of those guys that can relate to like, Oh, well, if you do something you love, you didn't work a day in your life. Like I never, I never could relate to that. That right. statement, you know, work is work is challenging and it's work, but it's, it should be rewarding. And I think anybody from the person that's a, a doorman, you know, to a porter, to, you know, whatever the president of a company, you can find purpose in what you're doing. It's there. You mm-hmm. just need to find it. And yeah. once you find purpose in what you're doing, it's a whole different level of engagement, man. And you can bring that joy in what you're doing, that pride in what you're doing. You can bring that back to your family and impact them with that. And yeah, man, it's all, it's all integrated. So we'll like see. That. see give, me, give me that quote one more time. It's uh, the world. You- uh, yeah. The, the world promises you comfort, but you're not made for comfort. You're made for greatness. Yeah. That's a good quote. I, uh, I'm going to use that on my next uh, vacation with my kids. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> nice. Cause right now the only quote I give them is, uh, I didn't promise you fun. I only promised you memories. So, ah, nice. That's great. <laughs> well, if you want to make them it. uncomfortable, just put rocks in their mattresses too. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's some, some kids. And then, need to- and then say the world doesn't pro- promise, you know, you're not called for comfort. You're called for greatness. Yeah. So go back to sleep and stop bothering me. Right. Exactly. <laughs> cool, man. Well, thank you so much, uh, Rob. It's awesome. I mean, you shared some really amazing things with us all the way from your story and how it happened. And, and then some of those things throughout that story, like, you know, treating, treating people with dignity and just having a principle centered, not just purpose, but a principle centered business and how that actually helped your business launch. We also talked about how, you know, some of those failures and those challenges and those hard times are, are some of those things that push you uh, in the next direction of your purpose of where you're supposed to go. Totally. And, um, and then you also share like some incredible nuggets of just like analyzing deals and, and creating a structure and a team and, and shared some of the wisdom and the practical knowledge of, uh, of setting up an yeah, investment yeah. like that. So thank you so much, man. It's been awesome having you on. Hey man, I'm, I'm just a normal guy, man. I'm happy, happy to be here and thanks for, thanks for having me, dude. All thanks, right, man. Appreciate it.